Once I stayed awake all night, waiting for Mum and Dad to arrive. They didn't. They haven't. But it's all right. Nobody drives up that narrow, rocky road from the village in the dark, unless their father Ludwig. He says God helps him and his horse with the steering. Mum and Dad were never very religious, so they probably wouldn't risk it. They'll be here once it's daylight. What I'm worrying about now is whether they'll recognise me after three years and eight months. You know how when you have a haircut or a tooth comes out, your parents carry on about how you must be the kid who belongs to the shoe mender down the street? Well, I've changed even more than that. When I arrived at this place, I was plump and little, with freckles and two gaps. Now I'm about twice as tall with glasses and a complete set of teeth. I press my face against the cold window pane over my bed and watch the sky start to go pale and tell myself not to be silly. I remind myself what Mum and Dad said when they brought me here. We won't forget you, Mum whispered through her tears. I knew exactly what she was saying, that they wouldn't forget to come and get me once they'd fixed up their bookshop troubles. We'll never forget you, Dad said in a husky voice, and I knew exactly what he was saying too that when they come, even if I've changed a lot, they'll still know it's me. The sun is peeping up behind the convent gates. Now it's getting light outside, I don't feel so anxious. Plus, if all else fails, I've got my notebook. The cover's a bit stained from when I had to snatch it away from Marek and Boris in class. It was to stop them reading it, and some ink got spilled. But apart from that, it looks exactly like it did when Mum and Dad gave it to me. It's the only notebook with a yellow cardboard cover in this whole place so they'll definitely recognise it if I hold it in an obvious way when they arrive. And when they read it, they'll know I'm their son, because it's full of stories I've written about them, about their travels all over Poland, discovering why their bookshop supplies suddenly went so unreliable, Dad wrestling a wild boar that's been eating authors, Mum rescuing a book printer who's been kidnapped by pirates, her and Dad crossing the border into Germany and finding huge piles of really good books propping up wobbly tables. All right, most of the stories are a bit exaggerated, but they'll still recognise themselves and know I'm their son. What's that sound? It's a car or truck, one of those ones that don't need a horse because they've got an engine. It's chugging up the hill. I can hear it getting closer. There go Sister Elvira and Sister Gresnia across the courtyard to open the gates. Mum and Dad, you're here at last. I'm so excited I'm steaming up the window and my glasses. I rub them both with my pyjama sleeve. A car rumbles into the courtyard. Mum and Dad must have swapped it for the old bookshop cart. Trust them, they've always been modern. They were the first booksellers in the whole district to have a ladder in their shop. I can hardly breathe. Half the dormitory are out of bed now, pressing their noses against the windows too. Any second now, they'll all see Mum and Dad. Suddenly, I don't care if everyone does know my secret. Perhaps it'll give some of the other kids hope that the authorities might have made a mistake and that their mums and dads might not be dead after all. That's strange. The car windows are steamed up, so I can't see clearly, but it looks like there are more than two people in the car. Mum and Dad must have given Father Ludwig a lift and a couple of his relatives who fancied a day out. I can't make out which ones are Mum and Dad. I hold my notebook up for them to see. The car doors open and the people get out. I stare, numb with disappointment. It's not Mum and Dad. It's just a bunch of men in suits with armbands. Felix, says Dodie urgently, grabbing me as I hurry out of the dormitory. I need your help. I give him a pleading look. Can't he see I'm doing something urgent too? Finding out from Mother Minka if Mum and Dad sent a note with the carrot, saying exactly when they'll be arriving. I've got the carrot with me to jog Mother Minka's memory. It's Yankiel, says Dodie. He's hiding in the toilet. I sigh. Yankiel's only been here two weeks and he's still very nervous of strangers. Tell him there's nothing to worry about, I say to Dodie. The men in the car are probably just officials from Catholic head office. They've probably just come to check that all our parents are dead. They'll be gone soon. I give a careless shrug so Dodie won't see how nervous I am about the officials and how much I'm desperately hoping Mother Minka remembers the story we agreed on about my parents, about how they were killed in a farming accident, tragically. 
Yankee was not hiding from the men in the car, says Dodie. He's hiding from the torture squad. Dodie points. Marek, Telek, Adok and Boris are crowding into the dormitory toilets. Come on, says Dodie. We've got to save him. Dodie's right. We can't leave Yankee at the mercy of the torture squad. Marek and the others have been after him since the day he arrived. He's their first new boy to torture in three years and eight months. Since me. Dodie shoves the toilet door open. We go in. Marek, Telek, Adok and Boris have got Yankiel on his knees. Yankiel is pleading with them. His voice is echoing a bit because they've got his head half in the toilet hole. Don't struggle, says Telek to Yankiel. This won't hurt. Telek's wrong. It will hurt. It hurt when they did it to me three years and eight months ago. Having your head pushed down a toilet hole always hurts. Wait, I yell. The torture squad turn and look at me. I know that what I say next will either save Yankiel or it won't. Desperately, I try to think of something good. A horse crushed his parents, I say. Now the new kid is staring at me too. I grip my notebook hard and let my imagination take over. A great big plough horse, I continue. It had a heart attack in the mud and fell onto both his parents and it was too heavy for him to drag off them so he had to nurse them both for a whole day and a whole night while the life was slowly crushed out of them. And do you know what their dying words to their only son were? I can see the torture squad haven't got a clue. Neither does the new kid. They asked him to pray for them every day, I say. At the exact time... They died. I wait for the chapel bell to finish striking seven. At seven o'clock in the morning, I say. Everyone takes this in. The torture squad look uncertain, but they're not pushing anybody down the toilet, which is good. That's just one of your stories, sneers Telek, but I can tell he's not so sure. Quick, says Dodie. I can hear Mother Minka coming. That's a story too, because Mother Minka is down in the courtyard with the head office officials. But Marek and the others look even more uncertain. They swap glances, then hurry out of the toilets. Dodie turns wearily to Yankiel. What did we tell you, says Dodie, about not coming in here on your own? Yankiel opens his mouth to reply, then closes it again. Instead, he peers past us, trying to see down into the courtyard. Have they gone, he says. Dodie nods and points towards the dormitory. Boris is putting mud in your bed he says. I mean the men in the car, says Yankiel. He looks almost as scared now as he did with the torture squad. They'll be gone soon, I say. Mother Mink is dealing with them. Yankiel starts to look a bit less nervous, but only a bit. I find myself wondering if he's got secret alive parents too. Thanks for saving me, he says. That was a good story about my parents being crushed. Sorry if it brought back sad memories, I say. Nah, says Yankiel. My parents froze to death. I stare at him. If that's true, it's terrible. Their bath must have been outdoors or something. Yankiel glances down at my notebook. Do you make up lots of stories? He asks. Sometimes, I say. I'm not very good at stories, he says. As we go out into the dormitory, I find myself wondering if Yankiel is Jewish. He's got dark eyes like me, but I don't ask him. If he is, he wouldn't admit it. Not here. Dodie stays with Yankiel, who's peering nervously out the window again, and I head off, hoping that Mother Minka has got rid of the officials so I can ask her about Mum and Dad. As I hurry down the stairs, I glance out the window myself. In the courtyard, Mother Minka is having an argument with the men. She's waving her arms, which she only does when she's in a very bossy mood. I stop and stare. What's that smoke? It's a bonfire. The men are having a bonfire in the courtyard. Why are they doing that? It can't be for warmth. The sun's up now and it's going to be a hot day. I can see why Mother Mink is so angry. The smoke is going into the chapel and the classrooms and the girls' dormitory. Oh no, I've just seen what the men are burning. That's terrible. If Mum and Dad saw this, they'd be in tears. The other nuns are down there in the courtyard and some of them have got their faces in their hands. I'm feeling very upset myself. The men are burning books. Mm.